Wednesday night and, and teaching on the book of Romans and, and trying to get a better understanding of this sinful nature that's inside each and every one of us, this thing we're, we're born with that lives in us, it breathes in us. That is, if we're not dead to it, amen? The Word doesn't say that it's taken out of our lives, that it's, it's taken away from inside of our being, but rather that we've been put to death. God don't rehabilitate us, He eliminates us. Amen? Amen. That's what carrying your cross is all about, being eliminated from this thing. You see, we can't be rehabilitated, Brother Bill. we got to be put to death. And in, in bringing forth that teaching on Wednesday night, I couldn't really get to where I, I wanted to go for the sake of time. I seen a few people yawning, so I had to cut it short. So I just decided to pick up where, where I was going to teach on last Wednesday night. And today I would like to minister a message entitled, A Body for the Christ, A Body for the Sinner, and A Body for the Saints. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You today, Lord God, for Your Word. For Your Word is truth, Lord God. It's a light unto our feet. It's a lamp unto our path, Lord God, to light the way, Lord, through this life. Lord, we ask today, Lord, that You would bring forth Your Word, Father, in power by the anointing of Your Holy Spirit, Lord, as we continue to point people to the work of Your Son at Calvary, Father, the great work that You provided, Lord. We ask that You touch our hearts. That you would touch us, touch our ears, Lord, and give us ears to hear, and we'll give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If we could, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And this is where we'll be, we'll be ministering today. And in, in studying the book of Hebrews and learning to understand the book of Hebrews, it's a, it's a book that's often misunderstood. It's a, a book that's often mistaught because people teach it out of context. They, they see a lot of things in Hebrews and it's taken out of miscontext because like I said, they take it out of context. They don't understand it. So it's important that we lay some groundwork on this great book of Hebrews and understand <laughs> that this book of Hebrews, first of all, it was written sometime between A.D. 33 and A.D. 70. And the reason we know that is because the temple was still standing when it was written. We, we're not quite sure who wrote it. I personally believe that it was the Apostle Paul, but that's just my opinion. That's my opinion. It, it's not clear. No one really truly knows. People might say that they definitely know, but there's no real evidence of who it is. But the big book of Hebrews was written to the Jewish people who had converted to Christianity. And what was going on in this fight of fight that they was, this fight of faith that they was walking in, a lot of them were being persecuted. I mean, you've got to realize and understand it ain't like us. Christians nowadays, I mean, we, we come to Christianity, we get saved, and oh, somebody teases us. Somebody makes fun of us. Somebody don't let us hang around them no more. The truth of the matter is, when the Holy Ghost comes to live in your heart, you probably ain't going to want to hang around them anyway. But you can't let that affect your life. But these people, they face real persecution. I mean, it was so bad that when a, when a son who was a Jew would convert to Christianity, when he would be saved, the family, the father, he would hold a funeral. They would hold a funeral and this son would be considered dead. He was now dead to his family. No longer to be a, a part of that family because he was a heretic now. you got to understand that these Jewish converts, when they came into Christianity, they were ostracized from their communities. If they had a job, they were kicked out of their job. If they lived with their family, they were pushed out. Okay, That's how serious this Christianity thing was back then. And what was happening, these people they were being they were being come against so hard that it was really starting to to bring a struggle to them that a lot of them were going back they were going back to the old sacrifice they were walking trampling the blood of Jesus the word was saying whenever you leave Christianity and you go back to the old sacrifice so we'd see that what this book was was written this this book of Hebrews it was written to show the superiority of this man Christ Jesus and this new covenant. It was written to show people that the old covenant, the old testament, it was just a type of what was to come. It was a shadow of what was to come. It was written to show that the blood and bull of bulls and goats, however, were, were a stopgap measure. But the blood of Jesus Christ was far more superior. Amen. Because in Jesus is a better covenant, a covenant. Amen. Because he's better than Moses. Hebrews was telling us. He's better than Joshua. He's better than Aaron and the, the priestly lineage. 
Amen. He's better than all of these things. He's better than the prophets. He's better than the angels. Amen. <laughs> because He is the creator of the angels. How can He not be better? He's better than all these things. All the Old Testament sacrifices. He's better. He's better. The Virgin Mary. He's better. No need to go to her. No need to go to her. The Pope. He's better. No need to go to him. No need to go to him. As a matter of fact, for those of you listening, I still love you, but the Pope is filled with the spirit of Antichrist and you need to get away if that's what you believe now. Amen. I hate to break it down like that, but that's just the truth of the matter. Full of the spirit of Antichrist because they raise up everyone but Jesus. But this man, Jesus, he's better. Whatever you have need of in your life today, he's better. He's better. Whatever ails you, he's better. Whatever holds you down, He's better and He can deliver you. Amen. He can set you free. In Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 8 through 6, we see that the merit of, of the founders or mediators of the Old Testament, they were compared to the merit of this man, Jesus. Amen. And they were compared and, and He was better. It would show us that He's better. In Hebrews 8 and 7 through 10 and 39, we would see the Testaments themselves compared. And we'd see in Hebrews 8, 7 through 13 that the Old Testament prophesied about the New. In 9, 1 through 10, 39, we'd see that the New Testament is the actual fulfillment of the Old Type. In 9, 16 to 10, 39, we would see that it's made effective with better blood. It's a better blood, amen? A better sacrifice, a better priest, a better man with better blood. And then... The fourth thing, in 11, 1 through 12 through, we'd see that this all works by faith. It's, it's faith, not as works, as the only way of salvation. Because there's only one work that could ever provide salvation. It was the work of the man Jesus. So before I go any, any further, let's read some scripture before I get accused of not reading the Bible and preaching out the Word. Hebrews chapter 10. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you would not. But a body have you prepared for me. Christ would say, But a body have you prepared for me. And if we was to go back into the book of Psalms and verse in chapter 40 and verses 7 through 9, we'd see a prophecy given, and it, it would say, Then say I. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the books. It is written of me. I delight to do your will. Oh my God, yea, your law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and truth from the great congregation. The will of the heart of Jesus was set forth to, set forth to Calvary. He was to do the will of the Father. And the will of the Father was always that the Lamb would be slain at Calvary's cross. That, that He would shed His blood for a lost world of sinners. That He could bring them back into covenant. That He could bring them back into relationship. So we see the, the book of Hebrews pointing this out. This better sacrifice. That God has prepared a body for the sacrifice. He's prepared a fleshly body for Christ, and that's what we see here is whoever wrote this book pointing that out and bringing that forth that a body was prepared, it was prepared for the Messiah, that he could be the fulfillment of every Old Testament type, every Old Testament sacrifice, starting all the way in the in the garden. I believe it was Genesis chapter 3, whenever they were coated with the lamb skins or with the skins of the animal, whatever type of animal it was, we seen the sacrifice take place. Amen. There had to be an animal. Had something had to be killed that they could be coated with his skins. So we've seen the, the first sacrifice by God Himself. 
Amen. So the first sacrifice was done by God Himself. And we see the last true sacrifice take place in the hands of God Himself. Amen. What He started, He brought to completion. What was going to take place for eternity, He brought it forth. He didn't lie about it. No, it was like a shadow we just saw. And it's important to understand about the shadow, and I've said this before, maybe not here, but in the past, what a shadow does, when you see a shadow cast forth, it tells you that something's coming. Amen? A shadow goes before a person as the light shines down behind them, and the shadow tells you that something's coming. You see, we've got a world of sinners running from the shadow. They're running from the shadow of the law because it tells them, Sinner, you're guilty. You're guilty, sinner. But rather, they should be running to the one that cast a shadow. You're a, you're a fornicator, sinner. You're guilty. You're an adulterer. You're guilty. You run around and you're living in sin. You're guilty. But don't run from the shadow. Run to the shadow maker. Amen? Amen. Run to the one the shadow represented. Because it's in Him you'll find redemption. It's in Him you'll find peace with God. Because the body was prepared for Him. And that's what we see right there in, in verse 5. Wherefore, when He comes into the world, He said, Sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body you have prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have had no pleasure. I want you to understand the reason He had no pleasure in the very thing that He ordained was because He could never take away sin. But it can only hide them. It was only a stopgap measure. So although he did, God did take pleasure in the sacrifice. But what he didn't take pleasure in was the fact that it couldn't do the whole job. It couldn't get it done because if it if it could have, it would have only had to be done once. But it had to be done yearly and daily, over and over the priest as they would sacrifice, as as the sinner would come to the gate of the tabernacle they'd come to the outer gates and they would the outer courts and they'd bring their sacrifice and the 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 throat would be slit of this of this goat of this lamb or whatever it was they was bringing the calf and the hot blood would be poured out it had to be done over and over it says about Job that he offered sacrifices daily for his children that he offered sacrifices daily for his children because he believed in what the sacrifice represented you see that's what made Job righteous. Job wasn't righteous because he was perfect. Job was righteous because he believed in the one that would make him perfect. Amen. That's the righteousness of Job. It wasn't because he never messed up, I promise you, because the Word says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So Job was in the same boat as you and I. He wasn't perfect because of what he did. He was perfect because of what he believed. But let me make this clear. If you believe right, there's going to be some change in your life. If there's been a change in your heart, there's going to be change in your life. Amen? Amen. So there was a body prepared for Christ to come down. A, a body, a sacrifice. He would be that sacrifice, Brother Bill. He'd be the one to, to carry that burden to the cross. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. That's what I just reverted back to in Psalms 40. Above when he said sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings and offering for sin, you would not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, amen, not this man, not you, but this man, Christ Jesus, after that he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, for by one offering, one offering, has he perfected forever them who are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts. And in their minds will I write them. 
and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Amen. God. Amen. Will their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. But, but go back one verse and make sure you pay attention to the fact that he said, He'll put His law in your hearts. He's going to do that. What I'm trying to tell you is that there's no way that you can continue to walk this life out living in sin That's right. without the convicted power of the Holy Spirit and think that you're saved and you're on your way to heaven. Because if He lives in your heart, He'll be convicting your heart. And He'll be ever drawing you unto Him. There's got to be a change. There's got to be a change. It's more than just a lip service. Amen. It's with the mouth that man confesses. But it's with the heart that he believes right. unto salvation. Amen. The devils believe and they tremble. But they're not changed. I'm here to ask you, have you been changed today? Have you been changed? Has your heart been changed? Do you still live the same way you used to? No way. Do you still act the same way you used to? Do you still talk the same way you used to? I'm not asking you, are you perfect? Because there's only one perfect. But I'm asking you, is there a change taking place? Can you look and examine your own heart and see a change taking place? Or has there been a little bit of change and the change has stopped? This is ever progressive. The sanctification process, it ought to be affecting our lives daily. Amen? It ought to be changing us from day to day, from glory to glory, from faith to faith. We ought to be being changed by the power of the Holy Spirit as He works in our lives and He transforms us. That's not a question I can answer for you. That's not my job. That's between you and God. But you need to ask yourself that. We're going to be traveling through a few scriptures here. I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 real quick. First Corinthians chapter 2, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 10. Amen. And what I want to do is I want to point out God's eternal plan. You see, this plan of God's, it wasn't something that He thought of after the fall of, in the garden. This was something He had planned from eternity. Something that was always going to take place. It wasn't a rebound effort, if you will, to counter what Satan did in the garden. Oh no. He's the Alpha and the Omega, Casey, like we talked about earlier. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He knows the beginning from the end. He always had a plan. 1 Corinthians 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and the <coughs> crucified. And just to point out real quick, that's why we preach what we preach here. Because I determined to know nothing. Save Christ and Him crucified because it's only that that will sanctify the saint. It's only that that will save the sinner. It's only that that will lead you through this life. Christ and what He did at Calvary. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them who are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the glory, before the world unto glory. See, this was always in effect. Christ and Him crucified, this was always the plan, Brother Curtis. This was always going to be the way. It was never going to be the Mormon church or the Catholic church or the Assemblies of God church or the First Baptist or Second Baptist or 800,000 Baptists. It was never going to be that. It was never going to be a denomination or a pope or even through Mary. Salvation didn't come through Mary, but it came through the man Jesus. And it was always going to be that way. That's what we saw right here. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, 
which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They wouldn't have crucified Him. If they knew it, I love that scripture, they wouldn't have crucified Him. They would have never brought Him to that cross. But they didn't know because it's hidden. It was hidden. It's God's wisdom that's hidden from the natural man. That's why it's, that's why it's a, a crying shame that we have preachers trying to dumb down the gospel to help people understand it. When God Himself hid it from carnal man. God hid His gospel from man. He hides it from wise men and He reveals it unto babes. What do you mean? I mean that He reveals it to the broken heart. He reveals it to the one that realizes they're lost. He reveals His wisdom. And His wisdom is all wrapped up in this man, Christ, and what He did in Calvary. I've said it a hundred thousand times. That when you look back two thousand years ago, and, and, and you think about this message, and you think about just how foolish it is, you mean to tell me a little Jew died on a hill, <coughs> on, a, on, a, on a cross, and he died for me. And now if I'll accept that and put my faith in that, I'll live forever. I'll have eternal life. That's what I'm here to tell you. No, that's just foolish. Don't make no sense. Don't make no sense to the natural man. Amen? Now let me give you a ritual to do. Light some candles and confess your sins or do this and do that. And, and, and it'll make sense. But God's message don't make sense to the natural man. Why not? Because we're at enmity, the Word says. We're carnal. We're at enmity. We're at war with God's plan. Gabriel showed me something on Facebook this morning. And, and I wasn't planning on using this, but I think I have to. This guy wrote, the best service we had all year. And in the service, the kids are up there dancing to rap music. Shaking their bodies all around. And they're calling this a service of the Gospel? It's blasphemy. And it's, and it's a heresy. And the people that allow this to go on, they better be careful because one day they'll answer. One day they'll answer to God. Because they gave up on what they thought was foolish. And the reason they thought it was foolish is because they're carnal. They're not spiritual minded. They're warring after the flesh. So this plan of God's, it was from eternity pointed out to us. It was always going to be this way. In, in verse 9 we see, But it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them who love Him. I want to explain something real quick. You see, because this scripture is often taken out of context and people will... will Take this scripture and see, boy, God's got some good riches prepared for me. Boy, I wonder what kind of money He's got prepared for me, Brother Bill. What kind of car, or what kind of big house He's got prepared for me. Once again, scripture taken out of context. Because what He has prepared for them is a Messiah. He has a body prepared for them. He has a cross prepared for them. Because that's the context of the scripture. Christ and Him crucified. For those that love God... He has a cross prepared for you. He has a body prepared for you. The body of the man, Christ Jesus, is the bread that you shall ever eat on. It's the body that He's given unto you. Why is it we always want money? And we always want new clothes and new cars and bigger houses and more vacations? Why is it that that's the things that we want? Because we're evil. Our hearts are evil. And we're all messed up. Well, Brother John, my heart's not evil. Well, read the Bible a little bit more and you'll see where it says that the heart of all men is desperately wicked and it's deceitful above all measure. Read and see what it says about the heart of man. That it's evil, Brother Bill. Not just their hearts out there, but ours in here are still, still evil. Still messed up. That's why we've got to be crucified daily. Amen. That's why we have to take up our cross daily. <coughs> take it up daily and follow after Jesus, the Word says. So, we'll see that the thing that God has for those that love Him is He has a body and He has Calvary. Amen? Amen? He has the body of Christ. He has the blood of Jesus. And He has a cross for you to carry. Amen? That's just the truth of the matter. And I said it a minute ago. So, for the sinner, the body He has, sinner, this is the Word He has for you. For God so loved the world... That He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in Him 
would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn it, but that through Him the world might be saved. That's for the sinner. Come and get it, sinner. Come and get the cross. Come and get the blood. Well, preacher, if He, if he sent Him not to condemn me, why do you condemn me by preaching the law? Because it's through the law that you'll see your need for a Savior. You can't stop preaching the law. You can't stop. Because if you don't preach sin is sin, no one will ever be saved. No one will ever be saved because they can't be saved. Because if they don't know they're a sinner, they won't go to the doctor, amen? Right. If you don't know you're sick, you ain't going to the doctor. Right. That's why it's a, a heresy, it's a, it's a farce, it's, it's unbelievable that the preachers stand up behind pulpits and they don't preach sin. And no one's getting saved. They're trying to convert them from the flesh because they're fleshly and they're carnal. And it's not just a few churches. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. The preachers are worried about feeding the flesh. Jesus wants to destroy the flesh and the preachers are worried about feeding it. The Word of God wants the flesh destroyed, Brother Bill. But the men standing behind pulpits, they want to feed it and make it feel good. Help us, Lord. They're antichrist. This is the, the mind of man, they're carnal. They're at enmity with God. They're warring with the very plan of God. And just like Cain, like I said Wednesday night, they hate the plan of God. Because the plan of God calls for death to self. It calls for death to self. Crucifixion. And it can't be done by the flesh. It can only be done by the Spirit of God. As you put your faith in who Christ is and what He did for you at Calvary. Amen. And as you do that, the Spirit of God will work in you and work through you to do a work in you and change your life. So many people sitting on pews today that aren't saved, they aren't converted, they go to church on Sunday and they feel good about it, but their hearts have never been changed. Their hearts have never been changed. And it's a shame that their preacher standing behind the pulpit allows that to go on. Oh, it's not his choice, but he's got to preach the truth of the gospel. He's got to preach sin to convict the sinner, but then he's got to lift up the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified so that the sinner knows where to go. Amen? Amen. If you're struggling in sin today, I want you to know that there's a cross prepared for you. Amen. There's a cross prepared for you. It's the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you know that you're one with Him when you come to Him and you give your heart to Him that you become crucified with Him? That you become a part of the sacrifice that was prepared before the foundations of the earth? Don't you know this? This is the Gospel. Don't you know? Amen. Yep. This is the gospel. You become a living sacrifice, crucified with Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God takes you, Romans chapter 6, and tells us that He places you in Christ. That you become immersed in the Christ, into His death, that you're crucified with Him. That's the cross you got to take up. Preachers running around trying to make up an imaginary cross. You go, well, this is your cross, and this is your cross, and this is your cross, and that's your cross. No, the cross that he's talking about is that of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you're crucified with Him, the Word says. That you've been planted into the likeness of His death. That's why Paul would say that I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth through me. Because He always pointed people back to the work of Christ at Calvary. Always. So, like I said a minute ago, the world out there, they're running from the shadow. They're running from the law. They don't want it. They want the Ten Commandments taken down out of the courthouse. They want Ten Commandments taken down from here and taken down from there. And, and the sad thing is, is what they don't realize is they're running from the very shadow of the thing that can save them. But it was only a shadow, Murphy. It was only a shadow. It could provide no righteousness. My shadow can do you no good. It can do you no good. I probably can't do you much good myself. But the one the law represented. Amen? Amen. The shadow of the one that the law represented, Christ Jesus, He can change your life today. He can change your heart. He can change your circumstance. Amen? But the world's running from the shadow. They're running from it. They hate it. We've got the world over here running from it. And we've got most of the church world that thinks they're actually living it. We got most of the church world that actually they think they're living by the Ten Commandments. They think they're completing them every day. 
They're foolish. They're carnal. They're self-righteous. And they don't understand the truth of the Word of God because they can't complete it. They can't live it. They can't do it. They can't complete it. Not one day goes by that they can live up to the measure of only the just the Ten Commandments, not much less all the other laws that was given. They couldn't even live up to ten, not, not to count all the several hundred that was given after that. And then if you want to add on more to that, the other six or seven hundred that the Jewish people made up themselves to, to try to make themselves feel self-righteous. You know, like the wearing the buns and the hair and, and wearing your skirts will make you more righteous. And if you don't put up no more put on makeup, you you'll be more righteous. And if you you know what I'm saying? That's that's the kind of stuff we do as humans. But it's only blood, brother Bill. Amen. That'll make the, the person righteous. It's only the blood. Luke 9 and 23 says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Keep your faith in the blood of Jesus. Stay united with Christ at Calvary. Continually walk after the way of the cross. Continually realize that in and of yourself, you cannot change yourself. You cannot deliver yourself. You cannot change your heart. You can't set yourself free from the power of sin. Only He can. That's the humility that God's looking for in a person. Not that you be free on your own, but that you would submit your life to the way of the cross. That you can be free through the blood of Jesus each and every day of your life. And I'm here to tell you, it's not always easy. Because we don't always understand it and we don't always do it right. But it's never the work that's insufficient, yet it's us. We're insufficient. But amen, He came for those of us, Brother Bill, that know we're insufficient. That know we can't live up to the measure. But this ain't an excuse to sin all you want. It's an excuse to be set free. Amen? amen. It's an excuse to be set free from the power of sin. <coughs> from the, the power of self-righteousness. From the, the power of religion. Colossians 1. 9 through 23, I'm going to read real quick. And like I said, I know we're going through a lot of Scripture, but man, this is good stuff. And if I would have studied a little bit longer, we'd be here all day. <laughs> Colossians 1, verses 9 through 23 says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will. Let me break that down. That's the knowledge of His will. Not, the, not my will for your life. Not the denomination's will for your life or the preacher's will for your life, but His will for your life. The Word says about us is that, that there's differences of gifts. Amen? Amen. There's different ministries. Amen? Amen. Now let me clarify that because the church went off in a whole new direction. Now we got the cookie baking ministry and we got the yard cutting ministry and we got the... Uh, the Wash people's clothes ministry and the hand bottle of water out on the side of the street ministry? No. The, the Word tells us that the ministry He's handed to us, that He's given us, is a ministry of reconciliation. Right. It's a ministry of reconciliation. Well, what is that? That's preaching the Gospel. That's proclaiming the Gospel. That's sharing the Gospel with the lost. Because the bad news is that man is full of sin and he's separated from a holy, righteous God. But the good news is, is that we've been reconciled in the blood of Jesus. Yeah. The ministry of reconciliation. Be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Once again, that does not mean that it's always peaceful. That means that we have peace with God through Christ Jesus. Church taking that and they're using it all whacked out and all out of order. Saying, oh, we got to be peacemakers. We can't make nobody upset. But the gospel makes people upset. That's what it does. As a matter of fact, it makes people so upset that they'll drag someone to a cross and crucify them. Jesus said He didn't come as peace. But He came as a sword. Because He will divide. He will divide the religious from His flock. Amen? Amen. He'll yeah. separate them. Thank you, Lord. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Here we go. Strengthened with all might 
According to whose glorious power? His glorious power. According to His glorious power. <clears throat> unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet. He's made us qualified. Amen? <clears throat> He's made us qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. If you were to study that in the Greek, you'd see that where it says He has delivered us from darkness and translated us into the marvelous light of His Son. You would see that that literally means that we were plucked up. Amen? By the Spirit of God, we were picked up out of darkness and placed in the light. We were plucked up, son, out of Adam. And we were placed in to the man Jesus Christ where all light dwells. That's a spiritual thing right there. That's good stuff. To just be taken from dark. Brother, I look back at my life and the way that my life was just changed around and there's no greater miracle. There's no greater miracle than someone could be headed down a road of sin, headed down a road of destruction, alcohol and, and evil desires fill their heart and just like that, they're plucked up out of darkness and they're placed in the light to be going the opposite direction. Oh, I'd love to see a dead person raised. But amen, I don't see one. I don't see one. I'd love to see an arm grow back or something like that because he can do it. And I believe he will, but there's no greater miracle than when a person, their heart is changed amen. by the mighty hand of God as they submit to his plan of redemption. No greater miracle amen. than an eternity is changed also. They were on their way to hell where they would suffer forever, separated from God. But now, just like that, they've been changed. And they've been placed into His marvelous light. All because the good news of the Gospel shone down in their heart and changed them. That's why we can't stop preaching the Gospel because it's only the Gospel that's going to change the heart. It's only the Gospel that will change the man. Nothing else. Oh, you might get him to act different. But you can't change his heart. See, that's why the New Testament is better than the Old. The New Covenant is superior to the Old. Because the Old could never change the heart. But the New, glory to God, it'll set a sinner free. It'll take the alcoholic and it'll turn him into a preacher. It'll take the adulterer and it'll turn him into a teacher. It'll take the, the hater and let the love of God shine through his heart. Unlike anything that man could ever do, it'll change them, Brother Bill. That's beautiful. The beautiful gospel of our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, unto all patience, long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of of the inheritance of the saints in light who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son in whom we have redemption through His blood even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature for by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And I want to point something out, and I wasn't planning on doing it. See, the church today, we've got a bad habit of thinking this is all about us. Oh, it's all about the church. It's all about the people. No, it's all about Jesus. It's all about the King. It's all about the Lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. Everybody's worried about their life. Everybody's worried about what they got to do. Well, what about Him? What about the Lamb who gave His life for you? What about Him? What will you do with the Lamb? What will you do with the Lamb? Will you put Him on the side of your life and use Him when you need Him? Just when you want to feel good about yourself? Or will you let Him change your heart? Will you let Him change your life and mold you into what it is that He wills you to be? Or are you too worried about what you will to be? And what you desire to be so you 
grab a hold of the Christianity that says I'll have my Jesus when I want Him and then when I'm done with Him, I'll put Him on the side. That's not the same Jesus I met. See, when I met the one I met, Brother Curtis, when I woke up in the morning, it was Jesus. When I walked through the day, it was Jesus. I would drive down the road and literally stare off into the sky and wonder if He was going to come back at this moment. <laughs> Amen. Because that's what the Spirit of God does to a heart when He changes it. Every thought, every waking thought was not about the New Orleans Saints. It was about Jesus. Every thought I had was not about my kids. I didn't worship my kids. See, I, I see parents today that run around and they worship their kids. They've made their kids out to be idols and they think they're doing the work of God by doing that. No, they're not. No, the Word, the word says that if you love your mother, father, <laughs> son, daughter more than you love Him, you're not worthy of Him. Amen. You're not worthy of Him. He should be the only idol that's lifted up. He should be the only one that we desire after. Lord, help us change our hearts. Change our hearts, Lord. Set us free from the bondage of, of sin that's in our hearts that holds us down and we lift up idols in our life. I'm not even talking about glass figurines. I'm talking about the things that sit on the shelf of our heart that hold us down, our, our relationships. I, I know so many Christians that are so bound up with wanting a husband or a wife that they can't even worship the Lord because all they want is for God to give them a partner. But the Word says that if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that all these other things will be added to you. But what everybody does is they come to God for a little while and they seek Him for a little while, but the truth of the matter is they're only seeking Him because they want everything else. But the heart's not truly seeking Him and they wonder why that the husband ain't coming their way or the things that they need in their life are not coming their way. There needs to be a converted heart. We all need converted hearts every day and renewed mind. Washing of the Word, the water of the Word, the Holy Spirit on our heart as He works through the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Change us, Lord. Change us. I keep losing my place here. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, where they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things, listen church, all things were created by Him and they were created for Him, not for you, for Him. Amen. This life isn't for you. It belongs to Him. Amen. And one day you'll answer for it. What you did with His life on this earth, not yours, His, because it belongs to Him. Right. You might not like that, but that's the fact of the matter. He created it, and it belongs to Him. And He is before all things. And by Him, all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Not the preacher. It's not the preeminence of the preacher. Too many churches worship their preachers. They worship their teachers. They worship the gifts that God has given to the body. It was never for a man to stand behind a pulpit and be worshipped. The preacher should never be worshipped. And if he lifts himself up as to some kind of ruler over the people, then you need to walk away. Because it was never meant but for one man to rule the church. The man Christ Jesus. He's the head. He's the head by whom all the churches join together. Yes, I preach the gospel. I teach the gospel. But I'm nothing more than a, a messed up, broken vessel that for some reason he allowed me to be used by him. I'll never un understand it. But He allowed it. I'm never to rule over people and to reign over people and to try to get them to follow me and my vision. Nowadays, too many preachers, they have, oh, well, this is the vision that God's given me. But for some reason, their vision ain't about preaching the gospel. It's about feeding the hungry or giving people clothes or doing this and doing that. Well, that's not the vision that God ever had for the church. The vision that He had was the ministry of reconciliation where the Men would preach the gospel and people would be saved. If that's not the vision of your preacher, you need to leave the church around. 
If the vision of your preacher is not to preach the gospel and lift up the work of Christ, if his vision is community service, you need to leave the church you're in because that's not the vision of God. That's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has never pointed to community service. He's, he's pointed to soul saving. He's pointed to the redemptive work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. What did Jesus say? That whenever He would go to the Father, that He would send back the Comforter. Amen? And the Comforter would teach us things that He's heard. And they would be about who? Jesus. They would be about Jesus. Just like Brother Mike Thomas said last Sunday morning when he preached the, the sign of Jonah in such a beautiful message. If you get a chance to watch it on YouTube, watch it. The spirit of prophecy always points to Jesus. The spirit of prophecy always points to the man Jesus. Amen. Amen. It will always point to Jesus because the whole word of God does that. Amen. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. Here we go, peacemakers. This is what it's all about. And having made peace through the blood of His cross. Having made peace through the blood of His cross. Having made peace through the blood of His cross. Take up your cross, church. Because in your cross, there's peace. In your cross, there's peace. It's the blood of His cross that made peace. By Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him I say, whether they be things in heaven, in earth, or things in heaven, and you who were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has He reconciled. He's brought back. To be reconciled, you have to have been there at one time. In the garden, man was separated. At the cross, man was reconciled. Like that song we just sang, at the cross. He brought us unto Him. He brought us closer. Amen? Amen. In the body of His flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Here we go. Here's, here's a big thing that the church don't like no more. If if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached unto every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. See, you can walk away from this thing if you want to. I know there's a lot of denominations that say that can't happen, but the Word of God is clear that that's not true. If your name could be blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life, then that means it had to have been in there to be blotted out. If you continue in the faith steadfast, if you fight the fight of faith and you continue to put your trust in Him and you continue to allow Him to work in your heart. Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. You're complete. So we see that God prepared a body for Christ. He prepared a body for the sinner. He prepared a body for the saints. Amen? And it's all the body of the man, Jesus Christ. The Messiah. The Savior. The Anointed One. The Holy One. The True Righteous One. In the book of Psalms, we would see David so many times as he would speak about being righteous. And so many people take that out of context and they don't understand that the book of Psalms is full of prophecy pointing to the anointed one. Amen. When you, when you see it talking about the righteous one, better know that it's talking about Jesus. Yeah. Amen. When you see it talking about righteousness, better know that it's talking about the man Jesus. Amen. Because He's the true righteous one. He's the only righteous one. And we can all be righteous when we're placed in His body. <coughs> Amen. Not this body. His body that He gave for you and I. The bread of life. And I'm about to close this thing down, but I want to I want to key in on just one more set of Scriptures. In Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 16 real quick. I'm going to read that real quick. Maybe. And you has He quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, 
among whom also we all had our conversation or our manner of living, if you will, in the times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. I want you to understand that if you're walking in sin today, and you're living in sin, and you're living any which way you think is the way you want to live, and it's okay, that you're a child of wrath and a child of disobedience. And if sin is ruling and reigning in your heart and that's what you're allowing, if you don't bow your knee to Jesus Christ and what He did at Calvary and let your heart be converted, one day you will face the fullness of His wrath and the fullness of His judgment will be upon your head. But if you'll meet Him at the cross where judgment has been pronounced, on the man Jesus Christ, and you'll cling to that work and let it change your heart. Oh, not just confess it with your lips, but let it change your heart. Then that's the only judgment you'll ever see until you see the judgment seat of Christ where we'll be judged by what we've done with what He's given us. Not to be sent to hell, amen, but for the crown that He has laid up for us, that we can lay it back at His feet. Because praise God, He's the only one that deserves a crown. Ain't no preacher Ain't no teacher, ain't no saint or any mortar that deserves a crown. Only Jesus. <coughs> but for some reason, He'll allow us to have one when it's all said and done. If you'll hold fast and continue in the faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. He's made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Man, I'm talking about this is now. This is resurrection life, Brother Bill. This ain't just after the resurrection. This is now. He has. That's past tense. He has raised us up together with Christ. If you've been born again, if you've been crucified with Christ, if you've been buried with Him and you've been resurrected in the newness of life with Him, then you're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father where there is peace and there's joy. Oh, I know we're in a storefront in Galliano, but the Word says about the saint that he's seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And all you got to do is turn your shoulder over to the left and look at the Father. <clears throat> and say, Father, this is what I need in my life. Father, this is what I need today. Amen. You ain't got to work to get there. You don't have to earn it. Ain't nothing you could do to earn what Christ freely gave to you except to continue to trust in His work. His salvation that He's so freely given that only cost just a little bit of His blood. It didn't cost us a lot. But it cost heaven its best. Amen. Right. And it will still save the sinner. And it will still sanctify the saint. If we'll point and teach the people about who he is and what he did. So you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, the word says about you. That's good stuff. It don't get any better than that. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. His workmanship. His workmanship, son. You're Christ's workmanship. You're His workmanship. You're not my workmanship. You're His. You belong to Him. You don't belong to a preacher. Casey, remember that. You don't belong to a preacher or to a teacher. You belong to the Spirit of God. And if you allow Him to mold your heart and change your heart, He will make you into something that the world cannot make itself into. The world cannot make itself into what God wants to make you and I into. A person of love. A person of truth. A person of honesty. Amen? Amen. A person that will stand and, and die for Him if necessary. 
But that can only be done by the grace of God working in you and through you. It can't be done by natural man. Wherefore, remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, now in Christ Jesus, who you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. One body, Brother Bill. He did it in one body. body of the cross. The body of Christ at the cross. A body for Christ, a body for the sinner, and a body for the saints. John would, John in, in the book of John chapter 15, and I think our brother Mitch posted this on Facebook just recently. Jesus would say, Abide in me. Abide in me. Abide in him, he would tell us. That word abide means to remain. It means to stay put. To stay in the place where you've been placed. When he plucked you out of darkness and he placed you into his marvelous light. I'm here to tell you today to remain in Christ. Remain in Christ, and you can only do that by continuing in the fight of faith that Paul talked about. Working out your own salvation, making sure that what's going on in your heart is supposed to be going on, that you're being changed by the Spirit of God, and that you're surrendering and submitting your life to the work of Christ at Calvary. I'm not telling you you'll be perfect Overnight, I'm not telling you that you're not going to slip and fall. I'm not telling you that you ain't never going to be messed up again. But I'm telling you to remain in the process. Abide in the the vine. And allow the vine to feed you. And to supply you with the nutrients that you need to be changed in this life. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're the bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ and, and He's preparing us. For a day when He'll present us unto Himself, the Word says. And if you'll continue to abide in the vine, then the words that ring true in Romans 8, 1 and 2, about being set free from the law of sin and death, they'll they'll be effective in your life. You see, because it's a spiritual law. And you want to be free from sin? Sin has bondage in your life. Sin controls you and tells you where to go and tells you what to do. It's because the law of sin and death is reigning in your life. And if you want to be free through it, it's only through the law of the Spirit of life. And that's only in Christ Jesus, Brother Bill. And it can only be there as you abide in Him. As you remain in Christ. Not as you go to church and submit yourself to a a preacher. Not as you go to church and submit yourself to a teacher. But as you submit yourself unto Christ. And whenever we'll all submit ourselves unto Him, He'll teach us how to submit ourselves one to another. That's true submission. Not to a preacher, but one to another. Amen? Amen. Let's stand.